We have a very special occasion today. All of us are privileged and honored to recognize recipients and members of the Distinguished Flying Cross who are seated at Table 5. The Distinguished Flying Cross is awarded for military actions involving heroism or extraordinary achievement while participating in aerial flight. President Coolidge presented the first medal to Charles Lindbergh in 1927. President George H.W. Bush and Jim Lovell are also members of the society. Many DFC holders flew Boeing aircraft, so it's particularly special to have Jim Alba here, and thanks to Boeing and Jim for sponsoring the table of these heroes. We now ask the recipients of the Distinguished Flying Cross at the table, as well as any other DFC holders in the room, to please stand and be recognized. And Chuck Sweeney, the President and CEO of the Distinguished Flying Cross Society, and Colonel Jack Jacobs are now invited to the podium. Chuck, I know it's going to be a very special honor for you to receive this plaque from the Wings Club, but given to you by Jack Jacobs, one of the 81 living Medal of Honor recipients. So, Jack, if you do the honors. I just, let me just make one remark here. This is being, uh, this is being presented by somebody who lived in two-dimensional space. So everything was very, very easy for an old infantryman. So my understanding of flying an aircraft um, well, you wouldn't want me to fly your aircraft. <laughs> I, I, I'm always astonished by people who manage to live in three-dimensional space. Uh, and, and you have the admiration of all of us, and all of you do, for, the, for your exploits in an environment which, for, somebody, for an old ground pounder like me, is almost impossible to fathom. Congratulations to you and all of your comrades. Jack, I'm actually very honored and humbled by receiving this from you. We, uh, in the aviation community, were there to support you guys. The boots on the ground were the ones that won everything. We were just supporting you. Uh, accepting this award on behalf of the Distinguished Flying Cross Society, it's a nonprofit organization whose membership exceeds 5,900 men and women. I also accept this award for the tens of thousands of men and women, officers and enlisted, of all five services who were awarded the DFC for heroism for extraordinary achievements in aerial flight, both in peacetime and during conflicts since 1926. I'd like to thank the Boeing Corporation for sponsoring our table and the Wings Club for the award. This recognition, coupled with the Society's recently published book, on Heroic Wings, Stories of the Distinguished Flying Cross, and our planned documentary film contribute to the DFC's primary goal of educating students and the general public about what aviation and these quiet heroes, both famous and unknown, did to preserve our freedom. Thank you all, and as a small token of appreciation, I would ask Bruce Whiteman to accept a copy of On Heroic Wings from Barry Landman, one of the authors on behalf of the Wings Club for their gracious invitation and for their aeronautical archive. Thank you very much. And Jim Alba is Executive Vice President of the Boeing Company and my very good friend. Jim has been with Boeing for 37 years. He joined the company in 1975 as a product project engineer. Jim was formerly the president and chief executive officer of Boeing Commercial Airlines, and he also led Boeing's defense, space, and security business as its president and CEO. Jim is an honorary fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics and board chairman of the Aerospace Industries Association. Welcome, Jim. Please join me.
Uh, so, Jim, uh, the state of the aviation industry today, is it strong, weak? Uh, now that you uh, are heading out, what are the things you, you really want to say about the state of uh, this entire industry? You know, the, the state of it really depends on your perspective. I think from a, you know, from a global standpoint, uh, you know, aviation is a, is a great industry. It's an aviation, it's an industry that, that creates, you know, 56 million jobs around the world. Uh, it's about 3.5% of the world GDP. Uh, I think we've been great environmental stewards. I think that, you know, we brought people together. We've really changed, changed the world. I think we've changed the way that people look at the world around them. I think from a, a manufacturer standpoint, I know, you know my good friend Barry is here, and we've got backlogs that, that are better than we've ever had uh, in history. At the same time, we've got a lot of airlines here. We've got Bill and we've got Dave, and you know, believe it or not, the, the airlines are going to make about $3 billion this year in total. So that sounds like a lot of money, but that's a revenue of well over $600 billion, so that's only half a percent. So it's a, it's a pretty thin you know, market out there for the airlines. I think we need more support, certainly, from the, from the governments these days. I mean, the fact that you know, the fees and, and landing rights and taxes that they continue to apply to the airlines, uh, an industry that is not making a lot of money uh, is a mistake. They're going to thwart growth. They're also going to thwart, I think, uh, you know, the hiring of uh, more people in the airline industry. I think you probably saw this morning the reports, you know, American is going to be uh, giving warrant notices to 11,000 people. Uh, you know, FedEx had their earnings call the other day and they talked about a slowdown in the freighter market. And, and, and certainly, you know, the airlines, uh, you know, their profitability goes with the world GDP. And of course, the world GDP to a large extent is impacted by the price of oil. As it goes up, GDP goes down, impacts traffic. Uh, in, impacts the airlines and eventually will you know, impact the, uh, the OEMs as well. Right. Let's talk about how the industry has changed. Uh, we've seen such consolidation over the last 10 years. In some ways you could say this is the, the rational economic outcome. For someone like you, how has that changed how, how you've done business and how will it change going forward if we expect, frankly, there to be more consolidation? I, mean, I think you're going to see a lot of what I'll call the mega airlines and they're going to have a lot more impact uh, in the marketplace than maybe they have today, uh, with consumers, with people that, that fly, but I think also with the with the OEMs, because they're going to have a lot of leverage, and they're going to have major procurements, you know, once a decade, and many of these procurements are going to be ones that, I mean, you never have to win anything, but we're going to be very incentivized uh, to try to win, and I think it will change the dynamics certainly. But let's say United, Merge United Continental, they, they have a, a sales cycle as you've described. How in the world do you prepare your business for that? It seems like such a, a binary moment uh, for such, a, such an important sale and you're competing against Airbus uh, on a regular basis. Just, I, I, it just seems like a very hard way to run a business when everything is flowing through two or three key decisions, yeah. at least for the domestic U.S. market. What you have to do, and I know that, that, uh, that Tom Enters would say the same thing if you were up here, as in very good as well. You know, we just have to continue to try to have the best airplane available. We know what the airlines care about. I mean, they care about your fuel burn. They care about uh, range. Uh, they care about payload. They care about maintenance costs. They, they care about emission dispatch rates. And we have to do everything we can to have an airplane that is, is the best. And, and then, of course, you know, after you have an airplane that meets all the technical requirements, then you've got to have the right, right price. Right. And I think airlines, and there are a number of airline CEOs in the room, and they're very sophisticated buyers. And uh, not every airline values the same thing the same way. And there will be times when you know, our offering might not be the right one for an airline. We hope that's not the case, but uh, certainly there have been times when they've made a decision to go with somebody else's airplane because they think it fits you know, their route structure better, uh, fits what their requirements are better. All right, now let's talk about costs for a moment. Obviously, it was a big moment when the, uh, uh, so much production moved, or some production moved to South Carolina. Can you talk about, frankly, cost structures for, for Boeing and how that's changing, competition for a labor market uh, uh, for uh, production here in the U.S.? That's, that's changed for you. That was a big change. Uh, when you look back on that decision, and it was a tough, it was a tough political decision. Back in the fall of 2009, you know, we knew we were going to have to invest in the 787 production line. And our first 
you know, reaction was, well, let's put it in Everett. That's where we do big airplanes. And, uh, you know, we talked to our, uh, our union partners about you know, what we'd like to see, you know, relative to uh, a plan going forward. And quite frankly, we couldn't come to an agreement on, on what made sense for them and what made sense for us. So we made a very tough call. We went to Charleston, South Carolina. And, you know, we, we drained a swamp, we got rid of the alligators, we built a factory. And uh, here we are almost three years later, and uh, we've got airplanes flying you know, out of that factory. I think if you look at the long term consequences of that facility, it gives us, uh, gives us options. But we've been very clear, you know, not just to the people in Charleston, but also to the people in Puget Sound that you know, putting work in a location is not an entitlement. You've got to earn it. And uh, you look at the difference in weight structure, and yeah, there is some difference in weight structure, but final assembly is a very small percentage of the cost of an airplane. And there are a lot of other factors, the degree of automation, the degree of productivity, uh, the quality levels that they have, all those things go into the decisions that we make. And do you think overall, we, we've seen an interesting, uh, I'd call it a mini renaissance of industrial production, fabrication here in the U.S. beyond obviously just aviation. And that is in part because wage rates have come down. We've seen it in the auto industry. People are willing to invest in factories because frankly they have to pay the workers less. Uh, do you see that as a, as a factor? You're probably not going to say wage rates are going to come down. The unions will have your head on a plate. But is that not the inevitable situation where we will will end up here in this country, well, which is more jobs, just uh, lower paying jobs. This marketplace over the next 20 years is uh, you know, $4.5 trillion. It's very attractive. And I think everybody knows what the Canadians are doing, what the Chinese are doing, you know, what the, the Russians are doing. And uh, you know we have to be competitive. And you know again, we like to think we can win on capability and value. But in the final analysis, the cost of building an airplane is something you have to consider, and we do. Right. And do you think that might mean uh, more work abroad outside of the U.S.? Now, we're not making any any, uh, any announcements today about where we're putting the work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so tomorrow, perhaps, there'll be, uh, there'll be a notice. But I, you know, we have a, a supply chain that goes around the world, and you know, we try to access the best technology, the best capability, and, and the lowest cost where we can find it. If that's the United States, we're really pleased with that. If it's not, you know, we'll go to where we can get the capability right. we need. Now you've done, uh, I think, uh, some work, uh, not a lot of work in China. And of course, that's where the market opportunity is and where the threat is, uh, a large threat. Once China really gets uh, a, a big domestic aviation uh, assembly business going. Uh, talk to us about your fears about technology transfer with Chinese partners. Well, we've been pretty clear with our Chinese partners about you know, export control and technology transfer. Uh, you know, there are crown jewels that, that we aren't going to allow outside of the Boeing company. Uh, there are other things that, that are not as proprietary that you know, we're willing to, to give to partners. We do that with partners in the United States as well. And what fits in the crown jewel list and the below crown jewel list? Just huh. a few examples. Well, I could give you a long list, but you know, how, how you design and build a wing, and you know, how you, you integrate the wing into the, uh, into the wing box, uh, you know, laminar flow technologies, and a lot of things that, that we're looking at. The aerodynamics that, uh, the aerodynamic models that we have, the, the structural models that we have, are very proprietary and things that have taken us you know, decades uh, to put together. But if I tell the Chinese the same thing that I, I tell anybody, we're not going to give you uh, enabling technology any more than we give it to Lockheed or Northrop Grumman or, or Airbus. I mean, these are things that differentiate us from the competitor, and, and certainly uh, Northrop Lockheed and Airbus feel the same way about not giving stuff to us. And we are very careful in, in what kind of technologies we're willing to give up. Okay. Uh, let's, let's move to the BAE deal. A lot of people are going to look at it. Certainly the EU will look at it. The United States will, the Department of Defense will look at it. And when we understand it better, you know, we'll, we'll have some, some views on it. I think Airbus must like our strategy too because it appears <laughs> that's what they're trying to do. Uh, but I think we'll reserve any more comments than that. Do you think it, well, I mean, I'll press again. Uh, do you think it's good or bad for the Boeing company, perhaps, that the U.S. will consolidate a bit more of its uh, government spend yeah. on U.S. based uh, providers? And I just spent some time, you know, talking with the Department of Defense just yesterday. They want to have several prime contractors so they can have competition 
for the big complex systems that they'll be building in years to come. Okay. As you think back on your career, 37 years, that's, that's a bit of time. Um, what's the thing that you, the one decision you wish you could take back? Back in 2001, uh, you know, I was running the Space and Communications Organization, and my view was to be a, a prime contractor, uh, to be able to be a contractor that could compete with Lockheed Martin, you know, we had to have a, a, a very strong satellite component that we didn't have. And we bought Space using Communications, we bought their satellite business. A very good business, great technology, great people. But when we got in there, we, we found out that there were some issues that had to be cleaned up. And, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to, to write down a significant amount of money. And, uh, you know, that was a tough one. But I think if I look back on that decision, and despite what we went through, you know, what we have today is a terrific satellite business. And we've been able to fix the issues they had. They're profitable. It allows us to have a space segment that we can integrate with our ground segments, our air segments, and even our underwater segments. So I think it really has allowed us to be a, a prime contractor that has the full spectrum of capabilities. There were a couple of scandals, uh, tanker scandal, not a, not a great moment, frankly, for Boeing. Um, has anything changed? What has changed? How do you think about those times and, and, and how the culture responded? And we have put a lot of focus on, on making sure that, that we do the right thing. I think the biggest lesson you know, from that was that we really understand how the actions of, of one or two people can have a significant impact on, on thousands of people, on ten thousands of people. And we have a, a session once a year where we get everybody together, they, and they put down their pencil, they, they put down their wrenches, and we sit down and talk about the values that made our company great. And we, we reaffirm ourselves to those values. But as we went through all those, those tough times, I think what, what really stood out to me was that our people you know, kept doing the right thing. Uh, we have an engineering-driven culture, and, and the engineers kept doing their job, the mechanics kept doing their job, and uh, you know, we came out of it okay. You uh, found a company that kind of, had kind of lost its engineering way, and that you helped uh, reinvigorate that. Would you uh, agree with that or not? I think there were some decisions that were made early on on a couple of our programs that I don't think the engineers had a seat at the table uh, when those decisions were made. What were a couple of those, Jim? Well, I think when we made the decision to, to outsource as much as, as we did, we lost control of critical elements of the airplane. I think when you know, we thought that you know, we could hang you know, brand new engines on a 747 and not have to redo the wing, I think that was a a decision if we had more engineers looking at it, we would have known what the true answer was. And again, we're an engineering company, and you have to have the, the right blend of people making decisions. You know, engineers, you know, marketeers, you know, business people, support people. And, and what are, I have tried to make sure that the engineers know how valuable they are because our heart, our soul is an engineering company, and always will be. Mm -hmm. the, uh, it was nice to, to see the presentation earlier from Bruce about uh, honoring uh, veterans, uh, it made me think about what the duty is of a, of a CEO, of a company executive, to his country. Does a CEO have a duty to his country? I posed this question before to CEOs, and frankly, their answer was no. My duty is to my shareholders first, and that is if you go through the system of a, of a market economy, that is what keeps the, the yeah. country strong. Do you agree with that or not? You might be a business person, you, you might be a CEO, but I think you're a, you know, you're a person and you're a human being first. And I really believe that the reason we were put on this earth was to make it a better place to live. And, and that's what we try to do each and every day. I mean, I look at you know, what we're trying to do, more fuel efficient airplanes. Uh, we're trying to be a, you know, a better steward of the environment. I mean, we're trying to allow the airlines to make more money and the, the customers to have you know, better comfort in the airplane. On the defense side, I think that, that we make systems that, that keep the world free. I mean, to me, we're trying to work for the greater good of the country and the greater good, you know, of, uh, of the world. I mean, I think about satisfying a customer, and we gotta do that, that's, that's priority number one. But if you take care of the customer, it's the right thing for the, for the company, and over the long haul, it's the right thing for the employees. 
Now, yeah, we have to make money. We get that. But if you build the right airplane, you build the right product, you make money, you reinvest it, you grow, you get more jobs. So I think this this thing all works together. Right, but still, for the duty to the country, it can be a difficult choice for a lot of people. You could build, uh, hypothetically, you could build some, some parts or, or do have a lot of facilities, say, in Mexico. Uh, might help the Mexican, Mexican economy. I think that the hard part is when you really have a, a nuts and bolts or dollar and cents decision that may hurt uh, the country, so to speak, uh, in a way that uh, may perhaps a patriotic CEO would, would not. We had 12,000 people in the United States last year. Uh, did we put a couple of jobs in Mexico? Maybe. But I, I think if you look at our track record as the, the largest exporter in the United States of America, I, I think we've always made sure that we take care of our, our workers. We always make sure that we're good citizens of the, the United States and the world. All right. Uh, Washington. I don't know if Washington is taking care of America. Do you have a view? Well, I'll bet you that you know, some of the airline executives here you know, wonder about you know, why the infrastructure isn't being invested in, you know, why we don't have an air traffic management system that could save them 12% of their fuel burn. I mean, I look at you know, what this, this country did when I was a kid. Uh, you know, I lived just downstream from Grand Coulee Dam. Well, you know, that was a, a big deal. The United States did that, it's creating jobs today. I think of the great things of my lifetime, you know, going to the moon, uh, curing uh, polio, uh, the interstate highway system. You know, what are the great things that this country is doing today? I don't think you can name too many. I'll tell you one that they could do, and maybe it's not on the scale of those others, but if they really care about the environment, and they really want to be energy dependent or independent, you know, they should invest in a space-based air traffic management system. You know, we spent billions of dollars on the 787 uh, to make this airplane 20% more efficient than the airplane that it replaced. For, uh, for a few dollars more, they can make every airplane flying 12% more efficient. They can help the airlines make more money. They can allow us to be energy independent. And we can also clean up the environment. Those are the kinds of big deals that I think they ought to be working on, and they're not. What the heck's wrong? <laughs> you know, if, if I knew, I, I, I would pick up the phone call and call my senators and, and call my congressmen. I mean, I think that. But there is something. I, I think that you know we elect people to work for the greater good of the company or the country, and I think too many of them uh, are working, you know, on their reelection, and, and that's very unfortunate. So, so, if you're giving advice to people in this room who perhaps feel the same way, what would be your advice to them? I think my advice would be to be a, an active participant in what's going on in Washington, D.C. I go to Washington, D.C. all the time. And uh, you know, my view is there's no appreciation for technology and innovation and engineering. And I like to joke that until Washington is run by engineers and scientists, somebody back there telling our story. And I think everybody here ought to feel the same way. I think last time I checked, there were just a handful uh, of engineers and scientists that were in Congress. Uh, you look at the number of dollars we spend on, on R&D as a percentage of GDP, and it's gone down dramatically since the 60s. You compare that to China, where uh, their top two leaders you know, are engineers or technical people, and where they are making a significant investment in R&D, and we are not. Everyone talks about education. Every candidate loves education. Every governor loves education. Every business person loves education. I've heard so much talk about education, and yet it seems that not much really is changing. If I look at what's wrong with this, this country, you know, what's wrong with our economy, and everybody talks about these, these short-term fixes, there's only one fix, and that's a long-term fix, and that's an investment in education. I mean, people talk about you know, equal opportunity, maybe not equal outcome. Well, we're not giving our kids equal opportunities. We're not, and we have to. What are the things we expect our country to do? And to me, the, the number one thing we expect our country to do is to give every, uh, every child the opportunity to have the same kind of quality education that most of us in this room have. I think it's economics, yeah. And uh, like, can you give an example of that? What, what do you mean? Of things you've seen? Well, how many people here sent their kids to private schools? A few people were brave enough to put their hands <laughs> 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 yeah. I, I went to a public school. I know probably
probably a lot of you did, and I'll bet you most of the people that went to public schools that are in this room probably a good percentage of them send their kids to private schools these days. Um, moving on, I, I kind of have a existential question for you. Um, I'm a physicist, <laughs> not a uh, yeah. All right, so maybe it's a question. Uh, <laughs> but uh, did you ever feel that uh, you were in a duopoly with Airbus? And you would have a big win, and then Airbus would have a big win. And then in the end, you were fighting this kind of battle without any real end. Uh, that you might have a few more sales than Airbus uh, this year over that year. But essentially, the market would be divided along the lines it was. And that as hard as you fought to, to make the sales and, and create a sales culture, that it really was pointless. If we thought. You know, we were automatically going to get half the market. We wouldn't have worked half as hard as we did. <laughs> so you're not being efficient. And Maybe I know, I know Barry feels the same way. And, you know, if you look at the marketplace, uh, yeah, Airbus has delivered more airplanes for the last few years. We'll probably deliver about the same this year. Our production rates are going up a little faster because of some of the big airplanes that we've sold. But I think the, the, the market is very efficient. Uh, again, the airlines very good buyers and we work very hard to satisfy their needs and uh, the reason it's broken down 50-50 uh, for the small airplanes I mean I think it's because of the the markets the requirements and the deals we put on the table I don't think it's anything preordained certainly the last thing that I want our team ever to think and, and that is that you know people buying airplanes from Boeing you know, is an entitlement people have been so excited it really has been exciting to see the images being backed uh, from the uh, explore, exploration uh, uh, probe there. Will we, given your experience and your background, do you think that we will see in the next 50 years, perhaps it's too long a time frame, in the next 40 years, uh, a person sent to Mars? Unless you know, the United States government changes their view towards human spaceflight, I'm not sure it's ever going to happen. But here we are in 19, what are we, 2012, the first time <laughs> since 1962, we don't have the ability to put an American into space. And uh, you think about the Russians when you know, the Soviet Union was breaking up, they didn't have two nickels to rub together. They kept their space program alive. And you know what, the irony of it is we helped them. And now what are we doing? You know, we're piggybacking a ride to space on their space vehicles. You know, right now, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, they said, let's go to an asteroid. Now, who wants to go to an asteroid? There's, there's nothing on an asteroid. <laughs> I mean, that's not, not gonna get the young people to decide they wanna be engineers. But you know, Neil Armstrong, he wanted to go back to the moon. And then he wanted to go to Mars. And I think the capability is there. I mean, we have to have the mission. We have to have the dream. And, uh, you know, we have to have leadership. And right now, I'm not seeing the mission, the leadership, the dream. And quite frankly, I'm not seeing anybody placing a lot of importance on the space industrial base, uh, you know, going by the wayside. And that's precisely what's happening. What it would take to uh, send a person to Mars? Well, going to space is hard. You got to go from zero to twenty-two thousand feet per second by eight and a half minutes. And uh, you know, I don't care who you're talking to. Uh, that's a control explosion, and the reliability of, of rocket engines right now uh, isn't as good as any of us would like it to be. And getting to Mars takes a long time, unless there's a new propulsion system that I haven't heard of. You know, it's going to take us quite a while. And there are all kinds of issues with, with gravity and and so on that have to be addressed. All right, so I will register you in the no column. When we convene back here for the 100 pounds. I'm hopeful, <laughs> but if I had to, to bet a dollar on it, I'd say no. I'd say no. <laughs> Thank you. Both join me here for just a moment. Uh, Jim, we want to give you this small memento that uh, I'm going to present to Jim. The Wings Club, a grateful appreciation for your presentation at the Aviation Leader Series of the Club, September 2012. Thank you. Jim and Jack and I are on the board of the Congressional Honor Foundation, and we have as a thank you for you. A